This armored reconnaissance unit is part of the Rapid Reaction Force. Their mission? To serve anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. One enemy Sabre heading north. I'm observing out. They are the eyes and ears of the army. Their task is that of the information gatherer and disseminator. They use the instinct of the poacher, combined when necessary with the use of speed and aggression. Their commitment is total, yet they are all volunteers with full-time civilian jobs. For a civilian job, I drive for a wine spirits firm. Um, I'm a delivery driver for them. So what I do in a week compares to nothing what I do in a weekend. Um, I've been in the actual TA for now nearly 11 years. I've enjoyed every last minute of it. Well, in civilian life, I'm a construction electrician for an industrial company on a chemical plant. At present, I'm a police officer with the Cheshire Constabulary stationed at uh, Chester um, on the armed response unit. So I'm the company director of a small heating and ventilating firm. They are all soldiers in the Cheshire Yeomanry, now formed as C Squadron of the Queen's Own Yeomanry. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, will you receive the civic and military pardon? Their history stretches back over 200 years and has taken them from the plains of Cheshire to service in South Africa, Palestine and Syria. In March 1996, their 200 years of service was recognised when they were granted the freedom of the city of Chester. The motion before the council is that in recognition of the links which the city of Chester has with the sea, Cheshire Yeomanry Squadron, the Queen's Own Yeomanry, and as an expression of the goodwill and esteem in which the squadron is held, Chester City Council hereby requests that on all ceremonial occasions, when members of the squadron are marching within the city, they do so with drums beating, colours flying and bayonets fixed, or such other ceremony that may be proper at the, at the time or appropriate to the occasion. In the 1790s, Britain stood alone against the might of Napoleon. The fear of invasion reached fever pitch. As the regular army was occupied in fighting abroad, a new force was needed to protect the country. Each county was encouraged to form its own defense force. In a surge of patriotic fervor, individual regiments of provisional cavalry were created. In November 1796, the landowners of Cheshire met together in Northwich. Sir Peter Warburton, who was my great-great-grandfather, about four times removed, um, was at that meeting. I believe he presided at the meeting, which had been called by the Lord Lieutenant of the day, Lord Stamford. And they uh, resolved to form a regiment of militia calling on their own estates. You see, all the officers who'd have been in the early regiment were all landowners, uh, some of them, as in my own case, families going back um, many hundreds of years. Uh, so they had estates with yeoman farmers on the estate who were required, as part of their uh, agricultural leases, to provide one man, I believe, and, and a horse. The bigger farmers would pr provide both, and the smaller farmers would provide either an able-bodied soldier or a horse. In January 1797, 15 officers received their commissions from the Lord Lieutenant, the Earl of Stamford. Six troops were formed, and the Cheshire Yeomanry was born. The system of each tenant farmer having to produce a man and a horse formed the basis of the Yeomanry for the next hundred years, as Ted Burgess remembers. Well, a grandfather took over the farm at uh, Brookhouse Farm, Tarvin in 1846 and in the agreement with the landlord he had to provide one man and a horse for the yeomanry which is general practice on all the estates th those days sometimes it was the son sometimes one of the workmen uh, it all depended on how they were fixed in 1803 the prince of wales gave the regiment permission to wear his triple feather crest and to call itself the earl of chester's regiment of cheshire yeomanry 
Their commanding officer was Sir John Fleming Lester, the owner of Tabley House, and one of the most influential men in the county. They received little financial reward. In return for a small government grant, each man had to provide his own horse, sabre, pistol, and uniform. Although enthusiasm was high, there was a system of fines to ensure punctuality and good turnout. Invasion fears got progressively worse, and the yeomanry was kept in a constant state of alert, ready to mobilize at the first alarm from warning beacons stretching from the coast across the country. If the beacons were lit, the yeomen had instructions to ride immediately to pre-arranged points where their squadron leaders would open sealed orders. In an order of November 1803, Colonel Sir John Fleming Lester recommended that each soldier should immediately supply himself with the necessaries as here specified and which they must have in constant readiness in their cloak bags. One worsted or flannel nightcap, one flannel waistcoat with sleeves to come well down over the loins, one pair flannel drawers, two shirts, two pair worsted stockings, one pair strong shoes, razor and strap, curry comb and brush, pipe clay and black ball. After the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815, the threat of invasion finally receded. The need for a home defence force against foreign invader was no longer so immediate. The role of the yeomanry began to change. The country was unstable, unemployment was high, and the demand for political reform was rapidly increasing. Riots became commonplace. Before the introduction of a regular police force, the only way for the authorities to deal with riots and civil unrest was by calling out the yeomanry. In August 1819, there was a mass meeting of 60,000 in St. Peter's Field, Manchester. The Manchester and Salford Yeomanry, who had only existed for two years and who consisted almost entirely of unskilled horsemen, were called upon to arrest Orator Hunt and the other leaders of the crowd. The Cheshire Yeomanry and the 15th Hussars waited at the back of the crowd. The Times reporter picks up the story. As soon as Hunt and Johnson had jumped from the wagon, a cry was made by the cavalry, have it their flags. In consequence, they immediately dashed not only at the flags which were in the wagon, but at those which were posted among the crowd, cutting most indiscriminately to the right and to the left. This set the people running, and it was not till this act had been committed that any brickbats were hurled at the military. From that moment, the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry lost all command of temper. As the Manchester Yeomanry were under risk of being overwhelmed, the Cheshire Yeomanry and the 15th Hussars were called in to rescue them, and in the ensuing melee over 400 people were injured and at least six killed. The event was nicknamed Peterloo, in parody of the Battle of Waterloo four years before. In the minds of the people, Peterloo was to tarnish the Yeomanry's reputation for many years to come. However, for their part, the Cheshire Yeomanry received several commendations and the thanks of the Prince Regent. Slowly, peace was restored to the Cheshire countryside. At Tabley House in 1826, Sir John Fleming Lester who was still Colonel of the Cheshire Yeomanry, was finally raised to the peerage and became Lord de Tabley. He had worked long and hard to achieve the honor and was so pleased that he had the portrait of himself in yeomanry uniform by Joshua Reynolds overpainted to show off his new peer's robes. With the establishment of a regular police force, the yeomanry was able to concentrate on practicing their cavalry skills. In the long years of the Victorian peace, their life became a round of drills, camps, and reviews. Although by 1888 they were allowed to serve outside their home county, they were not allowed to serve overseas. In 1889, His Royal Highness the Duke of Cambridge, who was Commander-in-Chief of the British Army, watched the Cheshire Yeomanry manoeuvring on the Rudy at Chester. Afterwards, he said, 
It is astonishing to me how a force composed of officers, men and horses, with only one week's training yearly, can go through a field day in such a favourable manner as they have done. I have now seen a good many yeomanry regiments, but I have never seen one better mounted, better equipped, better turned out, or one that could do a better field day than the Earl of Chester's Yeomanry Cavalry. As the new century began, the role of the yeomanry was about to change again. Britain faced a difficult colonial war in South Africa. In 1899, the War Office decided to supplement the regular army in South Africa with a trained mobile force. For the first time, the yeomanry were allowed to serve abroad not in their own regiments, but in companies of the Imperial Yeomanry. They were to fight as mounted infantry, exchanging their sabres and carbines for rifles and bayonets. Men from the Cheshire Yeomanry served in the 21st and 22nd companies. Many volunteered for the opportunity of fighting for Queen and Country. And in January 1900, the two companies formed up outside the town hall in Chester amidst cheering crowds. After arrival in Cape Town, they were soon dispatched to find the Boers. Several of the officers and men kept diaries. Prisca, March 28th, 1900. The result of our speedy march on Prisca did not result in any engagement. We expected a fight each day, and particularly just outside Prisca, which we found had been fortified. However, the Boers would not fight. From Prisca, we formed part of a column of a thousand mounted infantry and artillery to try and pursue the Boers and rebels, who had retired in a northwesterly direction. Nothing can be found of them anywhere as a fighting force. The Boers were guerrilla fighters and a frustrating enemy for a conventional cavalry regiment. Most of the yeomanry's time was spent guarding lines of communication their initial enthusiasm began to pall. One cannot imagine, unless he has been through it, the drudgery and weariness of three whole months in a place like Dracunda. Picture it in your minds. Nothing to gaze upon but a store, a small post office, two Dutch huts, a few Kaffir kraals and the vast barren veldt stretching out on either side without sign of vegetation, much less of habitation. Day after day, week after week, the same objects met our eyes, the same guards had to be mounted and the same duties performed, until we had almost forgotten that we were out on active service, wiping something off the slate. For the most part, the war was a disappointment. They saw little fighting, while the risk of death from disease was almost greater than that from enemy action. After a frustrating 18 months, the Cheshire Yeoman returned home to Chester in June 1901. Back home from South Africa, the Yeomanry reverted to their peacetime round of training, drills and camps. In 1908, the Haldane reforms brought in a new era of part-time soldiering. The Territorial Army was created, and the Yeomanry formed part of it. Their regiments were organized into 14 cavalry brigades, with the Cheshire Yeomanry becoming part of the Welsh Border Mounted Brigade. Their training was also linked to that of the regular army. The Yeomanry was now an important part of Britain's fighting capacity and they were soon to prove their usefulness. Immediately war was declared in August 1914, the recruiting offices were besieged with those eager to join up. For the men of the Territorial Army, mobilization took place within a day of the outbreak of war. Peter Edgerton Warburton's father was a young lieutenant. He went to war with the Arley Troop, which was the Arley estate, which was his home and uh, he would have taken with him a full complement of yeomen of all ranks, non-commissioned officers and troopers and yeomen, 
from the estates, from the farms and uh, holdings on, on the estate. The Cheshire Yeomanry was dispatched by train to Norfolk. Their job was coastal defence, and they patrolled a sector of the east coast covering 20 miles south of Great Yarmouth. Apart from the occasional Zeppelin raid, it was largely a period of inactivity. All ranks volunteered to serve abroad, and finally, at the end of 1915, the regiment received orders that it would at last be going overseas, but not as cavalry. So what they did when they sent us out, they dismounted us, see, because they're short of infantry men. See, we were, we were mounted infantry, see. So they took the horses off us and put us, kept us out on the foot. So which was better, because I hated to see the poor horses getting killed. They sailed to Egypt, where they fought against the Turks. Here, the second Duke of Westminster, who was a major on the strength of the regiment, was to excel himself. My forebear, the second Duke, bought these armoured cars. Well, in fact, he didn't buy the armoured cars. He bought the Rolls Royces um, from Crewe. And he raised this squadron um, in the First World War. And <laughs> he manned it um, with people off the estate. And it was called the Bee Eaton Squadron um, of the Cheshire Yeomanry. And he offered himself in the immortal fashion um, to the military authorities in France who said, we regard cavalry as on horses. And they were still horse-bound at that time. And he was told to go away. Um, anyway, so he said, well, I'm not standing for that. I shall offer myself to the Navy. And so he offered himself to the Navy. And the Navy thought he was a thoroughly good idea. You know, this was a bit of forward thinking. And uh, instead of having cavalrymen on horses, have them in armoured cars. And the armoured car basically was a Rolls Royce chassis. He cut the top off it. Um, and put a Maxim machine gun on it. And he up-armoured it a bit. Um, and then put his butler and his gamekeepers in and everybody else who sort of put their hands up. I mean, it was a case of, I think, you, you and you. Having travelled to the Middle East in his own private yacht, the Duke and his armoured troop were asked to rescue British merchant seamen who had been taken hostage by the Senussi tribesmen who were allies of the Turks. He, in those days, I think, travelled something like 300 miles through the desert with no navigational aids, um, not having a clue, really, where he was going, with limited mapping. And he ended up at this um, oasis. The mission was a complete success, and 91 sailors were rescued. In 1917, the Cheshire Yeomanry moved to Palestine, where they became part of the 10th Battalion of the King's Shropshire Light Infantry. Conditions were hard. The biscuits, I'll tell you honestly, the biscuits, you wouldn't, you, they won't give them to a dog now. Well, they wouldn't do it to a dog then, because they were six by six, by an inch thick. And when they got wet and that juice, and they'd be gr go green, and instead of, le instead of, uh, leather bags or ba bags to hold them in. You only had linen bags, see, in those days. Just linen bags. When they got wet or any uh, dew on them, used to, they were green in no time. So it was terrible times in then, in, 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 the food in, in those days. And as for water, we had fantasies you used to come up with, camels used to come up with uh, when we was laying about with uh, tanks with water in. The experience of marching round the desert in the heat of the sun was not popular with the yeomen. If they weren't able to ride horses, then riding camels would be better than nothing. Many volunteered to join the Imperial Camel Corps, some of whom were to escort members of the Arab revolt during the blowing up of the Hejaz Railway. The regiment as a whole took part in the battles of Gaza, Beersheba, Jerusalem, Jericho and Tel Azur. I was in the trenches at Gaza, and uh, just outside Gaza, we got blown up. And uh, I got dug out by the uh, ambulance men. The other men landed on top of me, so they said. So, and when they got, the, they got the three other men out, and they got me out, I was taken to the hospital, got and the, the very, very good there. And I asked the, the sister, how are the other lads doing?
They weren't with us anymore. He was the only one left. Jerusalem finally fell in early December 1917, and General Allenby triumphantly entered the city. Apart from service at the front, towards the end of 1917, the yeomen spent much of their time as temporary road builders, improving the line of communication. The enormous shortages of men on the Western Front meant that in early 1918, the regiment sailed for France, where for the last few months of the war, they fought as infantry in the trenches. They took part in the battles of the Somme, Bapaume, and Epey. This was bitter fighting, moving forward to occupy the German trenches, which were heavily defended. Their final assault at Epey earned them high praise from the commanding general. Your old battalion did one of the finest bits of work of the whole show. After fighting from 5.40 a.m. on September 21st until night, having heavy casualties, I had to call on them again to take a certain strong post before daylight. They went in at 12.30 a.m., killed over 100 Bosch, took 200 prisoners and 30 machine guns. They are all heroes. By the time the war ended, the regiment had taken heavy casualties. 10 officers and 174 other ranks had been killed. Their names were inscribed on a special memorial in Chester Cathedral. With the return to peace, Colonel Edgerton Warburton was made the new commanding officer with the task of rebuilding the regiment. At the end of the war, he seemed to be the obvious choice as the colonel to reform the regiment as a cavalry regiment because uh, it was the edict came out that uh, the yeomanry regiments who'd been split up and dissipated and made into machine gun regiments would get back, in their own words, their, their sabres and their spurs. They, got their, they went back to being horse horse regiment and uh, that gave him enormous pleasure. For some it was time to relearn cavalry skills. For others, particularly the new recruits, there was a lot to learn about the horse. It was a peculiar experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd never never been on a horse before but I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, fortunately, it, there wasn't a question of the the old-fashioned riding master with his whip. The uh, NCOs that taught us how to ride were, were very good, very efficient. Uh, they just sat us on the saddle and told us what to do, let us get on with it. And it's amazing how quickly one learnt. Well, first of all, you had to, to learn the points of the horse and uh, all about saddlery. All this would be dismounted to start with, with models and so on, or not the saddle, of course, that was really enough. And then having done that, you eventually arrived and found a live horse and were shown how to put the saddlery on uh, and put the bridle on, all the rest of it. And then you were shown how to mount, mount from the near side, and use things, how to put the blanket on, rough edges near and rear, or was it smooth edges, I forget. <laughs> but then you mounted the horse. And then you were taught to walk march, to trot, to canter, and finally to gallop. Well, this is just the general <coughs> horse furniture that we wore for uh, exercises and uh, for normal training. On here, you have your wallets, which carries your personal equipment. Over the top of it, you fold your great coat roll up. Along this side, you have the shoe case and the sword. That's the sword. Under normal circumstances, normal training, you don't worry about carrying spare shoes, but in the field you carry two spare shoes in that. And also, ten pounds of uh, feed, horses' feed, ca carried there. In addition, you have your canvas bucket just hung on. The, the, the horse and rider, when the rider had a complete kit on, uh, and the horse was in full marching order, 
give approximately anything from 18 to 20 stone in, he was carrying? Uh, a yeomanry uh, troop is made up of 32 members and a troop leader. Uh, and we ride in sections of four on exercise and then as a troop in line or in sections behind each other. We had a Lee Enfield 303 and of course we had the Sabre. And those were of course we carried on the horse. Uh, so um, we had to learn how to get on the horse by first, you had a bucket on one side of the horse which your rifle went in and you had a thing you know, where, the, where the sabre went in on the other side. So then you, you had to um, learn how to get on with these and mount the horse. Did anyone expect to use their sword? I wouldn't think that swords had ever been used really since the since Boer War. They looked very nice. They were very sharp. You, you toasted your bread on them and things like that, but, you, you know, we never got into close compass at all. Uh, yeomanry camps were quite a feature of the yeomanry and looked forward to immensely by the chaps because we were very leniently treated. Uh, we would start off in the morning with Rivali, usually at six o'clock, water feed the horses, and then we'd have our own breakfast, and then we'd go and parade about half past eight to nine, and there would be riding exercises then till midday. Then we'd come off exercise, uh, water and feed the horses, uh, and then in the afternoon we'd have lectures or uh, small arms drill, uh, rifle, sword, sword drill. And then, of course, the evening was free. Although the yeomen enjoyed their cavalry training, as the political situation in Europe worsened throughout the 1930s, and the threat of a modern mechanized war began to loom, many wondered whether the days of the horse cavalry were numbered. During that period, of course, a lot of the regular cavalry regiments were being mechanized. But of course, there was not enough vehicles or tanks or even guns for, for all uh, um, yeomanry regiments to be mechanized. And I think the yeomanry regiments were um, were great family regiments, and they wished to stay together, and provided we were allowed to stay together, and we had our horses, and we were prepared to go on, probably thinking that some time would come when we would be, become an armoured regiment. On the 1st of September, 1939, the regiment was mobilised in preparation for the war that was declared two days later. It was a process that had been well rehearsed. They moved to Whitwell in Derbyshire, the first task was to assemble more horses. Parties went out uh, to various parts of the country where they collected. I went to, to uh, Melton Mowbray in Leicestershire and brought about 20 horses back. And of course it was really, we went to farms where the new, where new horses were. And it was very sad really because some of these horses, which were thoroughbred horses and hunters, had been used by families for years, you know. and. Uh, Girls were crying, parents were crying, and Lord were commandeering these horses. And I, I think they were paid about 40 pounds for them. No argument. There's the money we took the horses. A lot of them had uh, head collars. Uh, all, all of them had collars, head collars, but attached to the head collars uh, were labels. Uh, and one in particular, I remember, uh, that uh, I brought uh, and kept, in fact, uh, it said against, uh, on the label was written, against friend or foe, I do my best. And uh, it was quite uh, emotional, really, taking these horses off families who had nurtured them, really. The horses and men had a few months for training before the news came through that the regiment would be joining other yeomanry cavalry regiments to form the 1st Cavalry Division, and that they would be posted abroad. Although their destination was top secret, Word soon got out that they were bound for Palestine. During the very cold winter of 1940, they faced a long train journey across France in almost Arctic conditions. On the journey, it was absolutely perishing. I can remember being issued with a, a ration, and it was two slices of sun tinned meat. Dreadful stuff. But it froze hard and it froze to the metal of the mess tin. So when you opened it, it, nothing fell out and nothing was there. Till you looked in the lid there, it was stuck to the lid. And you sort of pulled it off and it cracked. 
with crystals of frost. And um, even so, you're so damned hungry, you, you ate it. And also, of course, if you, you did duty in the horse boxes, that was good in a way, because there was heat from the horses. Particularly if you could push between two of them and pat them on the shoulder and then stand between them for a while, you could, might get warm. But when you had to move back away from them, the van itself, it was jolly cold the moment you got away from them. At last, they sailed from Marseille. For most of the yeomen, it was a fairly routine journey. However, for the horse party, it was a journey they would never forget. Of course, horses make a terrible mess. And as you can guess, when you've got all that few hundred on board a ship, you know, very much of a mess. So you couldn't chuck uh, all the dung and the manure and that overboard during the day, because as you know, there's a lot of straw brown and Lord knows what in uh, horse dung, and it would float and uh, give direction to the ship and the convoy. So it was all stacked up down on one of the lower decks um, beyond two great iron doors, which were not going to be opened until it's completely dark. And so you had a great pile of this stuff, and goodness knows how many feet wide and how many feet high, and it stunk to high heaven, acidy, ammonia sort of stink to it, made your eyes water like mud. And you put some shackle ropes together, fixed them to the iron stanchions, and then you got your shovel, and you shoveled the SH1T for all you were worth through the hours of darkness and, until you got rid of it, more or less, the whole lot. And it, it seemed to go on like that day after day. And when we arrived at High for the horse party, I was just about exhausted. It was January the 11th, 1940. I remember it because it was my 21st birthday. And I walked off that ship totally exhausted. We were billeted at um, Sydney Smith Barracks, uh, which were in fact a peacetime barracks uh, in Palestine. And the main job now really was to get the horses fit. And for the next two months at least, uh, we just walked the horses, uh, walk lead as we call them. Uh, and eventually of course the horses were brought back to uh, full health and strength. And then we started mounted exercises and the patrols in Palestine uh, on internal security. Their job was to keep the peace between the Jewish and Arab communities. We started patrolling out into the hills, working in conjunction with the Palestine police. We would surround a, a village on horses and they would go in. We weren't allowed to go in. We had one occasion when we were called out in aid of the civil authorities when uh, we went on to a street patrol in Haifa armed with pick hells. That, uh, we stayed out overnight, went back into uh, Sydney Smith Barracks the next morning. We had no excitement, nobody uh, attacked us. Well, I found Palestine, as regards got military, it was somewhat monotonous. It was sort of patrolling around to the Arab villages and making sure all was in order, and then put, uh, riding all the way back to wherever you were billeted and so on, yeah. We, we didn't get much leave, as a man with horses doesn't. The infantry all go half a regiment at a time, and we were lucky if we went so that the regiment was divided more or less into four, shall we say. So you had to wait weeks before you got any leave, because you just can't walk off and leave horses. Finally, the monotony of barrack life and police patrols was broken, when in June 1941, they received orders to cross the border into Syria. They now faced a conventional enemy, the Vichy French, who were still allied to the Germans. It was going to be our first taste of, of action, wondering what it would, in fact, be like as a mounted as a mounted unit in a modern role, in modern warfare role. Of course, they found the ideal job for us because what, in fact, we did was we, we acted as flank guard to the Australian infantry battalions. They were aware that the French had some uh, cavalry, Spahi cavalry, and uh, we were to prevent them from coming down behind behind the Aus advancing Australians and doing some damage. And I think that was the role we fulfilled. They were fighting in mountainous countryside with very deep valleys, narrow paths and fast flowing rivers. Horses were ideal for the task. However, they were vulnerable to air attack. I was with about six horses 
uh, right up against a cliff. So we were on a road and there was a cliff side and I got right into the cliff side. We saw this two planes come over and we thought they were one of ours, but they were French, they were Vichy French. And the next thing, they, they, they spotted us and down they came, firing their, their you know, guns. And, uh, well, I, I got as close as I could. Uh, mind you, I think the men in front had gone on in front, of course, and they must have taken cover. But I was left with these horses, and uh, the bullets were really, f you know, flying around. And I expected any minute, any minute we were going to be hit. We were, you were sitting target. But luckily, anyway, the, I wasn't. One of the obstacles in their path was the fast-flowing Litani River. A squadron was dispatched to see whether a small bridge at Rifid was intact and could be used by the main force. Just as the troop leader and two men had crossed the bridge, a machine gun opened up. Arthur Salter was following just behind. With the high rock side of the, the ravine and the ricochets and the noise, it was quite, quite frightening, quite frightening, really. My horse went down, actually. It tipped me into the river. I went, well, I, I took a dive anyway uh, into the river, and that wasn't terribly pleasant. I had a tin hut on and 90 rounds of ammunition in a bandolier and uh, riding breeches and boots, and um, the river was pretty fast flowing, deep in parts. He managed to climb out. By some miracle, no one was injured. It was only their horses that suffered. At least four horses were shot on the spot, and we had to destroy by our own farrier, who was equipped with and taught how to dispose of horses that were irreparably damaged, in his opinion. That's where I lost my mare, a uh, lovely chestnut mare, whose name was Susie, <laughs> and, uh, and our cumbersome, dear, warm-hearted, a uh, baggage horse whose name was Wilberforce. Luckily, the Spahi cavalry withdrew and allowed the yeomen to continue with their advance towards Beirut. On the 12th of July, the message came through that an armistice had been signed with the Vichy French. The regiment regrouped and proceeded to Beirut for the victory celebrations. There, they provided a guard of honor for the victory parade. They returned to Palestine, where their future role hung in the balance. The military hierarchy seemed to be uncertain what to do with them. At one point, they were going to become mounted commandos on the Turkish-Syrian border. The next, they were going to become an armored regiment. Finally, the decision was made that the last mounted unit of the British Army to have served in action was to lose its horses and retrain for signals. Uh, knowing that we were going to lose the horses, of course, I think there were very mixed feelings that the day had come. And because we'd uh, got a close, close companionship with these fellows, you know, we'd cursed them from time to time. Uh, but they were really, um, well, part of, the, part of oneself, really. We'd, we'd been out there for three years, I suppose. And when the day came that we were actually going to lose the horses and they were going to go to a remount uh, depot, uh, the first job was to handing in the saddles and the uh, equipment, bridlery. And then we realized that you know, the day really had dawned. When we got down to this corral sort of thing, the veterinary corps people and valiants took the hind shoes off and we sort of saddled them and they turned them loose in a corral of probably about 50 and a corral about a quarter of a half an acre, perhaps something like this. But then we went into town and uh, came back and had a, we'd had a few, like, and uh, we shouted the horse and various horses came up and we, we rode round the corral and, you know, like something mad. But uh, no one was injured, fortunately. But that was the last we saw the horses. The men were given tests and divided up to train as wireless operators, dispatch riders and linemen. Although they were split up, there was one consolation. We were able to keep our cap badge, which was one of the marvellous, really, because we expected that we would have to wear signals cap badge, you see, and everything, but no. 
and we still kept our name because we were known as the 5 LFC and, the, uh, and later on 17 LFC Cheshire Yeomanry Signals and we kept that name right the way through. That meant a lot to us, really did. Yes, really did. Those yeomen who qualified as signalers were dispersed and served with other units all over the Middle East and Europe. Alan MacDonald was trying to repair telephone lines during the intense artillery exchange at the Battle of Monte Cassino. After some hours, I got back to the um, control dugout, and um, I remember lifting up the flap and saying to um, Sergeant John McAdam, "How is it? I, I, I got kind of put a line on it." He said, "Give it a minute. You can come in. Just just a minute. We're crowded in here." I said, "Right. Well, I, they were as well." Down went the flap, I crouched against the sandbags and a most almighty roar, and there were plenty of roars, and the whole damn thing blew sky high. I was glad I wasn't inside with them. And some of the sandbags and me, we went, I don't know, 10 feet, 10 yards through the air, landed with one hell of a thump. And then it began to dawn, I was hearing all the sounds, and I could hear moaning very low moaning and then I could get the smell. There was a terrible stench, um, uh, I don't know what kind of ammo they use in these shop, but cordite, it says terrible smell of cordite and still lingering heat. And I thought, oh my God. I tried and started to walk into the place, but it was a shambles and they were all dead, a whole lot of them. After the war, the regiment returned to Cheshire to face many years of army reorganizations and changing roles. Despite passing through uncertain times, the pride of the men in their regiment did not waver. When in 1961 they received a new guidon or color, soldiers past and present turned up at Chester Castle to take part. Today, the yeomanry consists of some 39 successor units, ranging from armoured reconnaissance squadrons to gunners, sappers, signalers and nurses, each one retaining its old yeomanry identity. In 1994, the Queen reviewed the modern yeoman at a parade in Windsor Great Park. The Cheshire Yeomanry now forms C Squadron in the Queen's own yeomanry. Our job. Our actual role is to find the enemy, locate the enemy, and send the information about the enemy back. Just because we've got a gun in front of the vehicle doesn't mean we can kill things. Our job is stealth, to see and not to be seen. Moving forward in armoured vehicles, they gather information about the enemy and radio it back to their command vehicles, where it is assimilated and fed back to brigade or regimental headquarters. They are part of Allied Command Europe's Rapid Reaction Corps. The days of uncertainty are past. Theirs is a role with a future. The role will develop in the future. The world is full of very fancy and very clever gizmos and satellites and everything like that. But manned reconnaissance always will have a role because you've always got to have the human brain. And all the satellites of this world can't give you the human brain not only to gather information, but also to assess the information that has been gathered. Like their forebears, today's Cheshire Yeomen are part-time soldiers. They turn up each week for drill night, for the regular training weekends and annual camp. Right, so 30 millimeter, it's a quick fire sight. It's a pull in his neck, grab hold of him and rip him across. It's a pull in the head at all times. And then out the front of the wagon goes your cartridges, not into a wagon that's hurt anymore. 
just going to shoot out about 25, 30 metres in front of the head. Hey, ball! Time! The level of training and commitment is very high. It's basically a full-time job. I mean, the squadron as such is, is run, the uh, equipment, uh, the manpower and everything is exactly the same as a regular uh, recce regiment, except that we are, we are trying to do it in two weekends a month and one night a week. Right, you will be going down to see the warrior, which is down on the Fusiliers tank park. I'll be splitting you into two groups. What binds them together and keeps them coming back is a strong sense of camaraderie. Out of uniform, we get together, we have meals, we, we go out, we bowl, we do all sorts of things. We, a compact group, we seem to hang together more as a group than we do with, with, other, with other friends. You seem to get moulded into a group and you stay together. Um, and when you're out on exercise, it's just one long laugh. You know, it, it can be raining, it can be miserable, you can be tired, you can be hungry, but there's always somebody who'll say something will make you laugh. began 200 years ago as a mobile local defense force has proved its adaptability by evolving to suit the needs of its time. Now totally integrated into the modern army, the Cheshire Yeomanry has an important role to play. After 200 years, the spirit of the Yeomanry lives on. The Yeomanry spirit really could be summed up with that a combination of a sense of professionalism and a sense of fun. We work hard when we are required to work hard and we have our fun when we can. The human spirit, I think, is second to none. There was a saying, all cavalrymen muck in. In other words, if you're a cavalryman, you help everybody, irrespective of rank, and you always help each other out of any difficulties or problems. A great feeling. Thank you. 